well, thank you so much for the invitation to come down and speak with you today. And I apologize I wasn't able to make it in, in person. I hope to do that at some, some date in the future. Um, but today I'm going to talk about uh, valvular heart disease, anticoagulation in pregnancy, and this dictum that I was taught in 11th grade of there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. So thanks, thanks for joining today. So it helps to start by thinking about who we're, who we're talking about. Um, so we'll begin with a patient, a hypothetical patient, a 28-year-old woman with a bicuspid aortic valve who comes in to see you as a new patient, reporting that she played tennis in college and now really just goes for walks and thinks she might be slowing down a little bit. She has normal left ventricular systolic function with an EF of 60% on her echocardiogram and a bicuspid aortic valve, which meets the criteria for severe aortic stenosis with a maximum velocity of 4.3 meters per second and a mean systolic pressure gradient of 42 millimeters mercury. She's recently married, and as many of you can predict, her first question to you is, Doc, is, is it okay if I get pregnant? And this type of patient is probably familiar to a lot of us, and it's not a rare patient if you work in the field of congenital heart disease or certainly cardioobstetrics or valvular heart disease or general cardiology even, because there's been these enormous advances in the treatment of congenital heart disease for infants and children. And it's now the expectation that virtually all women born with congenital heart disease are gonna survive until adulthood. And the vast majority of them are gonna arrive at adulthood with really good health, expecting normal life expectancy uh, living active lifestyles and aspiring to live a normal lifestyle, and that includes having kids. So increasingly, it's becoming common for us to have to field this question to try to address the risk of pregnancy in women with structural heart disease. So just as a brief overview of what we'll be talking about today, um, we'll be talking about preconception evaluation of women with aortic stenosis. We'll be talking about valve choice in women considering pregnancy. We'll be talking about anticoagulation for mechanical heart valves in pregnancy. And then at the end, we'll shift gears a little bit and we'll talk about the style in which we give counseling um, to patients and how that affects their choices. And this is not entirely specific to the questions of pregnancy or congenital heart disease, but we'll just review some of the data about how, uh, how the words we choose affects what patients hear and what they decide. So coming back to our patient with severe aortic stenosis who wishes to get pregnant, it's not that there's no choice, there are no good options of what we might do for a patient like this, it's that there's unfortunately a lot of options, but each of them comes at a price. So perhaps if our greatest concern is the safety of the patient, we can anticipate that severe aortic stenosis will pose some risk. And if our number one priority is trying to shield our patients from risk, we could go ahead and discourage patients and tell them and tell her, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think it's a good idea for you to become pregnant. The problem with that, of course, is your patient is unlikely to be happy with that. It might be unnecessarily restrictive. Um, and as we learn over and over again, there is certainly no guarantee that our patients are going to listen to us if we give them advice. So you might end up with a unhappy patient or you might end up with a patient who goes off and becomes pregnant uh, outside of the care that you might be able to provide. So if patient satisfaction is our number one priority and we all wanna do well on our press gainy surveys and do well in patient satisfaction scores, we can tell the patient, no, no problem, go ahead, become pregnant, uh, we gotcha. Uh, the concern there, of course, is there, there is risk to pregnancy with severe valvular heart disease. So that might be exposing the patient to more risk than, than she might be comfortable with. You could try to address the hemodynamics prior to conception and recommend a preconception bioprosthetic aortic valve replacement. But as we'll talk about, we can anticipate accelerated valve degeneration in young women who get bioprosthetic valves. If we want to avoid the problem of early degeneration, we could choose for durability and recommend a mechanical aortic valve before pregnancy. But as we'll talk about in some depth, there's a substantial risk of maternal thrombotic complications and there's high fetal risk from the anticoagulation that we need to use for women with mechanical heart valves. We'll get into that in some detail. And increasingly what we are recommending is a preconception Ross procedure, but that really is very center dependent. It's the right surgery. If you have the right surgeon and the right outcomes, 
but I think there still needs to be uh, more, there's, there's more to be learned about the widespread application of the Ross procedure for young patients with valvular heart disease in terms of long-term outcomes. So what is, what is the right choice for a patient like this? So patients with valvular stenosis are going to increase their gradients over the course of pregnancy. And this makes sense if we think about it, because we know that both stroke volume and heart rate increase during pregnancy. So in this top left graph, we have uh, a graph of stroke volume here in the y-axis from the time of conception all the way through pregnancy and into the postpartum period. And what you can see is that stroke volume peaks around the end of the first into the second trimester and then plateaus and remains high throughout the rest of pregnancy. The curve for heart rate looks similar. Heart rate goes up during pregnancy. And of course, since cardiac output is the product of heart rate and stroke volume, we can expect cardiac output to go up, peak towards the end of the second trimester and remains considerably elevated throughout the rest of pregnancy. So women with a fixed valvular stenosis are going to have increased gradients across their valve, even with a fixed aortic valve area. So here was one study that looked at systolic pressure gradients in women with aortic stenosis at three different time points in pregnancy. We have the mean systolic pressure gradient in the y-axis and the time in pregnancy in the x-axis. And what you can see is that the women who started with a mean gradient solidly in the moderate range in the high 20 millimeters mercury, had an increase in their pressure, pressure gradients by 30 to 50% over the course of pregnancy. And many of these women fulfilled the criteria for severe aortic stenosis by their second trimester with mean systolic pressure gradients over 40 millimeters mercury, and it remained elevated throughout pregnancy. And this may be well tolerated in many women, but in a patient with a vulnerable ventricle or uh, at the edge of uh, decompensation or ventricular uncoupling, this could in theory precipitate heart failure and decompensation over the course of pregnancy. So we know the gradients will go up and not surprisingly with increasing gradients in cardiac output during pregnancy, aortic stenosis we can anticipate will expose both the mother and the fetus to risk of increased complications during pregnancy. And thankfully, we don't leave it to each individual clinician to figure out which cardiac lesion is uh, the riskiest during pregnancy, but fortunately we do have risk scores to identify maternal characteristics that put women at risk of adverse pregnancy outcomes. The three most commonly used risk scores that we talk about when we uh, work in the field of cardioobstetrics are the Zahara risk score, which is the European score published in the European Heart Journal in 2011. CARPREG, which was recently updated to the CARPREG2, this comes out of the group in Toronto, and the most recent iteration was published in 2018. And then the World Health Organization has also put forth a risk classification schema. And CARPREG and Zahara are similar in their, uh, in their methodology. They each studied a cohort of women with cardiovascular disease to determine which maternal features increase the risk of pregnancy, came up with a set of uh, clinical characteristics, and then applied that to a validation cohort to delineate which maternal characteristics predicted risk to the mom and the fetus during pregnancy. The World Health Organization risk score is a little bit of a different schema. It's more of an expert consensus where they took a collective of folks who care for women with heart disease and pregnancy and categorized each lesion in a one to four scoring system, one being essentially no substantially increased risk of adverse outcomes during pregnancy. This would be things like uh, repaired ASD, BSD, or isolated PACs or PVCs, all the way up to risk categorization four, which would be considered the lesions which are prohibitive risk for pregnancy. This would be things like pulmonary arterial hypertension or um, severe systolic heart failure with class three or four symptoms. And it's important to notice that all, four, all three of these scores identify maternal aortic stenosis as a high risk condition. So our instincts are correct. AS is high risk for pregnancy. But again, that's really insufficient to provide adequate counseling for a woman with aortic stenosis who wants to get pregnant because what they're going to want to know is how high is the risk and what are the risks. Importantly, CARPREG and uh, Zahara use these uh, combined outcomes, which combine very important risks like death and stroke and uh, permanent disability with probably less important risks, things like maternal arrhythmia and need for uh, new diuretic. Uh, 
And it's very hard to take that combined endpoint and counsel a woman about her risk for pregnancy because some of those outcomes are gonna matter much more than others. So we were a little bit in the dark uh, until the ROPAC registry came along. And the ROPAC registry, for those of you who don't know, has been this, this, this transformational registry out of the European Society of Cardiology. It's the Registry on Pregnancy and Cardiac Disease. And it is a prospective global registry of pregnant women with structural or congenital heart disease. And since 2007, they've enrolled over 5,700 pregnancies from 138 centers in 60 countries. And by virtue of being a prospective registry, it's been pivotal because it avoids all the problems of recall bias and reporting bias and publication bias that we saw with retrospective or single center studies. And the ROPAC registry has really changed our knowledge base uh, in terms of how we quantify risk in women with heart disease going into pregnancy. And in 2016, the ROPAC registry published their registry on pregnancy and cardiac disease as it relates to aortic stenosis. And this included 96 women with moderate or severe aortic stenosis. They published the results in Jack. And the population consisted of 62 women with moderate AS. And in that group, the peak pressure gradient was 48 millimeters mercury. But there were 34, year, 34 women with severe aortic stenosis prior to pregnancy. And these women actually had quite severe aortic stenosis. The peak gradient in this cohort was 89 millimeters mercury. The vast majority were asymptomatic, 96% New York Heart Association class one or two. And as a whole, they had preserved systolic function. So if we jump to the results, the top line result of the ROPAC paper on aortic stenosis is that there was no maternal mortality. So what we have is three columns here, the entire cohort on the left, those with moderate aortic stenosis in the middle and severe aortic stenosis on the right. And boxed in green, you can see that there was no maternal mortality across any of the cohorts. And obviously this was fantastic news. I'd be remiss not to mention that there was substantial maternal morbidity in the cohort. So if you look at maternal cardiac admissions, it was 21% across the cohort, 11% with heart failure and 21% with preterm birth. And if you look just at the cohort with severe aortic stenosis on the right, you can see, not surprisingly, those numbers are even higher. More than a third had an unplanned cardiac admission, nearly a fifth had heart failure and preterm birth in more than a third of them. So not, in, not a non-morbid condition, but thankfully one without mortality. So based on the results of the paper, the authors submitted a proposed schema in their central illustration that you're all familiar with from Jack. And here's what they recommended is what they consider to be a reasonable pathway forward. And I, I concur with this. I think it's, it's a reasonable approach, it's, which is if you have a woman with less than severe aortic stenosis, here a maximum velocity of less than four meters per second, she's asymptomatic and she has a normal left ventricular ejection fraction, you can probably counsel her that it's reasonable for her to go ahead and become pregnant without additional preconception testing. If on the other hand, you have a woman who comes to you preconception with severe aortic stenosis, a maximum velocity more than four meters per second, who is asymptomatic, has a normal EF, they recommend getting an exercise test and a BNP. And if those are normal, go ahead and advising that pregnancy is reasonable risk. On the other hand, if they're symptomatic or their exercise test is abnormal or their BNP is abnormal, then you would counsel against pregnancy. And again, this makes sense because severe symptomatic aortic stenosis or severe aortic stenosis with an abnormal exercise test or a BNP is an indication for aortic valve replacement. And a dictum is that if someone has an indication for intervention prior to pregnancy, you should complete that intervention prior to pregnancy. But what happens if a woman comes to you during pregnancy with severe aortic stenosis? If she's asymptomatic with a normal EF, then you just monitor through pregnancy. However, if she's symptomatic, they recommend trying medical therapy, although we need to recognize that there's really limited medical therapy available to us for severe symptomatic AS. There's really just volume management. If that fails, moving forward with either balloon aortic valvuloplasty or aortic valve replacement, or likely in the current era, transcatheter aortic valve replacement during pregnancy. Uh, we're not gonna talk much about AVR during pregnancy, but we can discuss it uh, at the end if, if folks are interested. 
So this was a big paper. It was published in Jack. It was important. It was the most impactful paper on aortic stenosis in pregnancy that I think had been published in, to date. And it got a little bit of press. So the European Society of Cardiology at their meeting reported this as a breaking clinical trial. And many of you probably receive cardiology news carefully shrink wrapped into your uh, mailbox each week. And their headline was the ESC says there's zero risk of death in pregnant women with severe aortic stenosis, which was exciting. Uh, except we all know that that's not quite true. We know it because of individual case reports, this one showing women, a woman with severe aortic stenosis who died shortly after delivery, a 24-year-old woman with sudden death in the third trimester from severe aortic stenosis, and from our own center, a 23-year-old woman who died in the postpartum period with severe aortic stenosis. So there was certainly no death in that cohort of 90-some-odd women with aortic stenosis, only 30 of whom had severe aortic stenosis, but I think it would be premature to say that the risk of death is actually zero. So taking that information, what do we say when we come back to our patient? Which of these choices would be right for our patient? Well, she's asymptomatic, preserved ejection fraction, but she is, uh, has severe aortic stenosis. I think in our clinic, we would get an exercise test and a BNP, and if those were normal, we probably would counsel towards pregnancy. And if the exercise test or the BNP were abnormal, then we would probably counsel towards some type of uh, valve restoration prior to pregnancy. And in our center, I think we would recommend a Ross procedure if she were, if she were anatomically suitable for it. Uh, so this is consistent with, with what the central illustration of the Orwat paper had to suggest. So what are our choices? Let's say we decide that she does need an aortic valve replacement prior to surgery. Well, let's talk a little bit about the pros and cons of a bioprosthetic aortic valve replacement prior to surgery. Well, the good news, of course, is that it's going to restore the hemodynamics prior to pregnancy and will probably be effective at getting her through her pregnancy uneventfully. And of course, the good news is that after the first few months, there's no need for long-term anticoagulation throughout pregnancy. However, there are considerable trade-offs. We know that bioprosthetic valves generate faster in younger patients. There's really conflicting data as to whether pregnancy may accelerate valve degeneration. And if we put a bioprosthetic aortic valve in a young woman, we're likely setting this woman up for many repeat sternotomies over the course of her lifetime. And while this may be reduced in the era of valve and valve taver, that has yet to really uh, play out. And we don't really know what the long-term outcomes of valve and valve taver are in young patients. So here's some data showing that bioprosthetic aortic valves to generate faster in young patients. This is a remarkable single center study of over 12,000 patients with bioprosthetic aortic valves stratified by age at implantation. The y-axis is structural valve degeneration, the probability of structural valve degeneration, and the x-axis is time. And what you can see is that patients who were under age 60 at the time of implantation, highlighted in orange here, are much more likely to experience structural valve degeneration than patients older than 60 and certainly than, than those older than 80. And as I said, it's uncertain whether pregnancy accelerates valve degeneration. So while a preconception bioprosthetic valve may result in good pregnancy outcomes, repeated sternotomies are likely. Well, if we want to avoid that cycle of fast degeneration of bioprosthetic valves, I suppose we could recommend a mechanical prosthetic heart valve prior to pregnancy, but of course, Mechanical heart valves put both the mother and the fetus at risk. So on the left, we have the maternal risks of mechanical heart valves in pregnancy, namely valve thrombosis, embolic complications, and hemorrhage. And on the right, we have the fetal risks of miscarriage, fetal demise, and teratogenic effects of anticoagulants. And when we talk about this, we need to remember that pregnancy is a hypercoagulable state with an increased risk of thrombosis and poor anticoagulation options. And even though women may have a normal PT, PTT, and INR, they have anything but normal coagulation profile. So here's a table just showing sometimes the very dramatic up to tenfold changes in coagulation factor activity during pregnancy. And we know that this overall translates into a twofold increase in coagulation activity, which is the cause behind the fivefold increase of DVT and PE that we're all familiar with during pregnancy. So mechanical heart valves have an accelerated rate of complications during pregnancy. So prosthetic heart valves put the mother and fetus to risk. And if we wanna know exactly how much risk, 
Again, we're fortunate to be able to turn once again to that ROPAC registry. In 2015 in circulation, the ROPAC authors published their data on the outcomes of women with mechanical heart valves in pregnancy. This paper doesn't stratify by different anticoagulation strategies very well. It lumps together all the women with mechanical heart valves who became pregnant. And remember, this is in a contemporary cohort. The outcomes were not very good. 23% had a cardiac hospitalization, 15% had a major hemorrhage, 5% had valve thrombosis and stroke in one and a half percent. The fetal outcomes were not better. 16% miscarriage and 3% fetal demise after 24 weeks. Preterm birth rate of 18% and a congenital abnormality rate of 5%, probably due to a combination of teratogenic effects of anticoagulation combined with the heritability of maternal cardiovascular conditions. So high rates of maternal, high rates of fetal complications. But very importantly, the maternal mortality over the cohort was 1.4%, and the major event rate to the mother or the fetus was 42%. And remember, this is over the course of just nine months. This is not the lifetime risk. This is not the 10-year risk. This is just the risk of, of, of adverse events over the course of a single pregnancy, mortality of 1.4%. So because of this, the conventional wisdom is that when possible, it makes sense to avoid mechanical heart valves in women planning pregnancy. Okay, but how do we help women with mechanical heart valves who are committed to pregnancy? Or alternatively, what do we say to an already pregnant patient who wants to find the safest anticoagulation strategy for her and her baby? We start with a primary dictum, which is uninterrupted effective anticoagulation is required throughout the entire pregnancy for all women with mechanical heart valves. So when we talk about anticoagulation for mechanical heart valves, of course, we all use warfarin, which is an effective anticoagulant, but unfortunately is toxic for the developing fetus. Just as a brief reminder about warfarin embryopathy, warfarin embryopathy occurs primarily when the fetus is exposed between weeks six and 12, up to 10% risk of deformity, 20% risk of loss, and is characterized by mid-face hypoplasia, short limbs, you have an anticoagulated fetus, and that's true regardless of what stage in pregnancy the woman is taking warfarin. And there's variable reporting as to whether there's intellectual impairment in babies born with warfarin embryopathy. So what are our strategies? Well, we want to mitigate the risk of warfarin on the fetus while still providing adequate anticoagulation to the mom. So fundamentally, there's three strategies we can do. If our primary objective is to minim minimize the possibility of toxic effects of anticoagulants at the fetus, we could use heparin for all three trimesters. So this slide breaks it up into first trimester, third, second trimester, and third trimester. Heparin all three trimesters. Heparin and low molecular weight heparin are large molecules. They don't cross the placenta. They don't touch the fetus. So there's no risk to the fetus, but it's not as good an anticoagulant for mechanical heart valves. If we want to strike some sort of balance by minimizing the risk of warfarin embryopathy but anticoagulating the mother well, we could use heparin in the first trimester and warfarin in the second and third trimester. And if we want the most effective anticoagulation strategy for mom for all three trimesters, we could use warfarin throughout. Okay. Before delivery, we always switch to IV heparin because you don't want to deliver a woman anticoagulated with warfarin. So, We'll start just by talking briefly about this pivotal meta-analysis that came out 20 years ago now in the archives of internal medicine. This was a meta-analysis published by Chan et al. of 28 papers published between 1966 and 1997, looking at 1,234 pregnancies of women with mechanical heart valves. And because of the era that the papers were published, half of these women had ball and cage valves, two thirds were mitral valves. And overall in that cohort, the maternal mortality was 3%. So what were their results here? So what we have is the three anticoagulation strategies in the rows, heparin on top, heparin in the first trimester transitioning to warfarin in the middle, and warfarin for all three trimesters on the bottom. And then we have three columns of maternal death, death thromboembolism, and congenital anomalies. And what we found is that when you look at maternal outcomes, they're worst in women who take heparin all three trimesters. They're intermediate in women who take heparin for the first trimester and warfarin for the next two. And they're best in women who take warfarin for all three trimesters. 
And unfortunately, and not surprisingly, you see the exact opposite trend as it relates to fetal outcomes, where they're best in women who take heparin all three trimesters and worse than women who take warfarin for all three trimesters. So there's this balance that you're trying to strike where any benefit you get in maternal outcomes is offset by fetal risk. So the take home risks, the take home messages from that 2000 meta-analysis is that pregnancy, no matter how you do it, is high risk for women with mechanical heart valves. Unfractionated heparin throughout pregnancy with that 7% maternal mortality rate had unacceptable maternal outcomes. We just should not be using three trimesters of IV heparin or subcutaneous unfractionated heparin in pregnancy. And warfarin for all three trimesters associated with poor fetal outcomes. It was a highly impactful paper, but we need to recognize that a lot has changed since the 1960s. We no longer use ball and cage valves, which are highly thrombogenic. We've moved to these bileaflet disc valves. We no longer use IV heparin routinely in pregnancy. We've switched to low molecular weight heparin with its more stable half-life and better, uh, better uh, pharmacokinetics. Unfortunately, not everything has gotten better since the 1960s. I was just lucky enough to go see Paul McCartney in concert a couple of weeks ago. If he does come down to you guys, I highly recommend it. That was music in the 60s and uh, Bieber is what we got now. So anyway, with this in mind, a couple of years ago, uh, one of uh, my fellows and I, who's now faculty with us, Zach Steinberg, decided to update this paper with the goal of uh, comparing contemporary anticoagulation strategies for mechanical heart valves for women in pregnancy. And we wanted to describe maternal and fetal outcomes that were of interest to the patients and doctors. So that we didn't repeat the information that was gleaned from the 2000 paper, we decided to be more exclusionary in the papers that we included. We decided we were gonna include only papers that reported unambiguous outcomes in women with mechanical heart valves who were treated with either VKA, warfarin, or uh, low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin. And we were going to exclude studies that included a high number of ball and cage valves, high number of right-sided valves, small studies previously published, and those that used fixed dose heparins. This is what we came up with. Our original search yielded 825 papers, and we were able to immediately exclude nearly 600 of them. Another 100 were review articles or not terribly useful. We were left with 155 papers, which seemed like a lot, but when we went through them, a large number were small case series, had ball and cage valves, were, uh, did not report carefully on outcomes or were otherwise not, not usable. And we were left with 18 papers over describing 800 pregnancies, which is still a pretty large number of pregnancies, but it just shows how hard it is to find high quality data in this field. What we did is we compared four strategies of anticoagulation during pregnancy. We looked at warfarin throughout, and then we stratified that among women who require more or less than five milligrams of warfarin per day to maintain a therapeutic INR, and I'll talk about that more in a, in a moment. We looked at dose-adjusted low molecular weight heparin throughout pregnancy. We looked at low molecular weight heparin transitioning to warfarin, and then we looked at unfractionated heparin transitioning to warfarin for the second and third trimesters. So we wanted to find out which of these four strategies gave the best results for the mom and for the fetus. We decided to look at outcomes that we thought would be unambiguously important to both the women and the doctors. We looked at maternal death, we looked at major embolic complications, and we looked at prosthetic valve failure requiring reintervention. And then for fetal outcomes, we looked at spontaneous abortion, that is loss before 20 weeks, and fetal death, that is loss after 20 weeks. And then we looked at congenital defects and embryopathy. So this was our central illustration. And what we found is that the risks for the mother and the fetus were high for all the strategies. So first, we'll look at the risk for the mother. And these are a graphical depiction of the percentage risk of a major event to the mom with each of the strategies. Warfarin and low-dose warfarin both had about a 5% risk of a major complication. And all the strategies that used heparin had a nearly three-fold increase in maternal risk. Of course, when you look at the risk to the fetus, it goes in the exact opposite direction. That vitamin K antagonists had a 35% risk for the high-dose cohort, where it was cut in half in women who were able to take low-dose warfarin. Low molecular weight heparin and low molecular weight heparin with a VKA had lower risk and unfractionated heparin 
to a VKA still had very high risk. And that may reflect the uh, parts of the world in which unfractionated heparin were, were still used. And then when you look at the combined outcomes to either the mother or the fetus, the, the risks are high no matter what strategy you use. High dose warfarin has a more than 40% risk to the mother or the fetus. The lowest cumulative risk was for the women who were lucky enough to maintain a therapeutic INR on low dose warfarin. And those that used heparin had high cardiovascular risks. So there was no low risk strategy and everything was a trade-off. Warfarin being safest for the mom, heparin being safest for the fetus. Right after we published our paper, a group out of Europe published a very similar meta-analysis in the European Heart Journal, and we were relieved to show that it showed more or less the similar results. They came up with 46 studies with nearly 2,000 women. They were a bit more inclusive in their inclusion criteria with 2,500 pregnancies. When we look at warfarin versus sequential treatment versus heparin for all three trimesters, you see this familiar trend, warfarin safest for the mom, low molecular weight heparin is riskiest for the mom, and fetal loss is highest with warfarin and lowest with low molecular weight heparin. They had a nice figure that was able to stratify fetal risk according to low-dose warfarin versus high-dose warfarin. And what they found is that low-dose warfarin in green was associated with a higher probability of having a live birth and lower teratogenic effects. So this builds on evidence base that low-dose warfarin is safer than high-dose warfarin as it relates to fetal outcomes. So one question is, why is low molecular weight heparin so ineffective? I mean, dose-adjusted low molecular weight heparin is a pretty effective anticoagulation option. And uh, Yuri Elkaim's group has published uh, extensively on this. They are strong advocates of low molecular weight heparin throughout pregnancy. And what they argue is that we are targeting too low an anti-10A level, that if we target a peak anti-10A level of 0.8 to 1.2, patients spend a large portion of their day subtherapeutic in terms of anticoagulation. So this bar chart here in the middle of the screen, the y-axis is the percentage of your time you are subtherapeutic, that your trough level will be subtherapeutic depending on what your peak anti-10A level is. And what you can see is that if your peak anti-10A level is less than one, there's a very high probability that your trough will be subtherapeutic. Even when you're in the range that we recommend, half the time your trough level will be subtherapeutic. And it's not until your peak 10A is above 1.2 are you therapeutic throughout the day. So increasingly, and at our centers, we will not just use peak levels, we'll use trough levels, and we'll try to Goldilocks dial in that just perfect level of low molecular weight heparin. I just need to re-emphasize here that there's absolutely no role for weight-based fixed dose low molecular weight heparin in pregnancy for mechanical heart valves. It's absolutely contraindicated. You have to meticulously follow anti-10A levels. So what's the data on low risk warfarin being better than high risk warfarin, high, low dose warfarin being better than high dose warfarin as it relates to fetal outcomes. Well, this was a highly cited paper from Vitaly et al. from uh, now 23 years ago. They looked at 58 pregnancies stratified by whether women were able to maintain a therapeutic anti-10A on low dose or high dose warfarin. These women took warfarin through all three trimesters. For the women who were able to maintain a therapeutic INR on less than five milligrams per day, 28 of 33 pregnancies resulted in a healthy fetus and five out of 33 had complications, but those complications were relatively mild, things like small for gestational age or IUGR. And when you contrast that with the pregnancies in women with, who took high-dose warfarin throughout pregnancy, what you saw is that only three of 25 ended up with healthy babies on delivery, and 22 out of 25 had complications, including embryopathy, spontaneous abortion, and stillbirth. So low-dose warfarin really does seem to be safer than high-dose warfarin as it relates to fetal outcomes. However, once again, case reports can prove the, uh, the exception to the rule. So here are four carefully reported cases of women who took low-dose warfarin throughout pregnancy and had babies born with warfarin embryopathy. So again, as we counsel women, we need to remember that none of these rules are absolute that the 
risk of warfarin embryopathy is lowest with low dose warfarin, but it's certainly not zero. So in 2020, we were tasked with updating the valvular heart disease guidelines with trying to take all of this data and update the 2014 valvular heart disease guidelines to reflect what the new data showed in terms of contemporary practice uh, in terms of uh, what we should be do what we should be doing for anticoagulation for valvular heart disease in pregnancy. And thank you to great mentors for Catherine Otto for including me in this. So we wanted to update the guidelines to reflect contemporary science and eliminate reference to anti antiquated therapies like three trimesters of unfractionated heparin. And we also wanted to acknowledge that there's no perfect options and that we really needed to value patients' priorities. So here's some of the flow charts I just wanted to share from the valvular heart disease guidelines. For women with mechanical heart valves, we recommended a class one recommendation for saying that they should receive therapeutic anticoagulation with frequent monitoring throughout pregnancy. I think that's fairly non-controversial. And then we said we should ask whether women really can maintain that therapeutic anticoagulation and frequent monitoring throughout pregnancy, because some women cannot for whatever reason, either lack of access to healthcare resources or social determinants of health. Uh, some women can't do it. And in that case, you should counsel against pregnancy in that population. Even for women who can maintain therapeutic anticoagulation with frequent monitoring, we put in a class one recommendation that you should counsel the woman that there is no anticoagulation strategy that is safe for the mother and the fetus, and you should really engage in shared decision making as to whether pregnancy is consistent with the woman's goal and her appetite for risk during pregnancy. We'll now move into what to do if the woman does become pregnant or you encounter a woman with a mechanical heart valve who is pregnancy who is pregnant, excuse me. So if their dose is less than five milligrams per day, that's this flow chart on the left, if they're able to take less than five milligrams of warfarin per day, the preferred anticoagulation strategy is to continue warfarin for all three trimesters. That being said, we recognize, especially here in the United States, the, um, the risk tolerance for birth defects is low, lower than it is in Europe and many other parts of the world. So after a careful discussion, we allowed for a 2B recommendation for dose adjusted bone molecular weight heparin for the first trimester, switching to warfarin for the second or third trimester, but did not provide an option for low molecular weight heparin for all three trimesters. Then we said, okay, if they take more than five milligrams of warfarin per day, do they have access to dose-adjusted low molecular weight heparin with monitoring of 10A levels? That's true almost everywhere in the United States, but we recognize that people in low resource countries may be uh, accessing this document too. So if they can take low molecular weight heparin, we recommended low molecular weight heparin for the first trimester, and then switching to warfarin for the second and third trimesters is a 2A recommendation. But once again, recognizing that there is some fetal risk associated there, we did allow for women who wish to minimize fetal risk to take low molecular weight heparin for all three trimesters. And then for women who don't have access to low molecular weight heparin, you can use continuous IV heparin for the first trimester and then warfarin for the second and third trimester. But uh, I think this is going to be uncommon in the United States. Prior to delivery, you stop warfarin and switch to heparin, and then you hold the heparin prior to delivery. So those were our recommendations. And when I think back and look at the trade-offs inherent to anticoagulation strategies in pregnancy, it reminds me of a dictum I was taught in 11th grade by my environmental science teacher. It's that there's no such thing as a free lunch. So I think this comes out of a story that I was told that you know back in the late 1800s, they would build saloons near construction sites and they would serve free lunch, but the free lunch was high in salt and it would make people thirsty and people would buy beer. And then somehow the free lunch would end up costing more than if you just paid for and brought your own lunch from home. Um, so you can't get something for nothing. And that's true, not just in free lunches and pregnancy and heart valves, but it's true, true, true in multiple aspects of life. The thinner your phone, the faster the battery is gonna wear out by the end of the day. But what we know is that when it comes to anticoagulation strategies for women with mechanical heart valves in pregnancy, everything is a trade-off. You cannot simultaneously minimize the risk to the mom and minimize the risk to the fetus. Everything comes at a cost. 
So with that in mind, what are we going to tell our patient? And here I wanna pivot a little bit for the last few minutes to talk not just about what we tell our patients, but also how we tell our patients things impacts the decisions that they make and what they hear. And now let's pretend our patient comes to us. She's got a mechanical heart valve and she's asking, hey doc, you know, what do you think? What's the risk of me having a successful pregnancy with a mechanical heart valve? Well, here's a list of three true statements you could make to your patient. Statement one, a pregnancy for you would be high risk. I think that's indisputable and pretty non-controversial statement. Statement two, that's also true. The most likely outcome of the pregnancy is that you and your baby will both be fine. That's statistically true. No matter how bad we are at choosing an anticoagulation strategy, the odds are that both mom and fetus will be fine. True statement number three, you're more than 100 times more likely to die during your pregnancy than a woman without a heart condition. So these are three true statements. These are all accurate, but you can imagine that each of those statements may motivate the woman to make a different choice. Patients don't always hear what we mean to say. And I think we all know this intuitively, but the people that really know this literature are malpractice lawyers. So if you read in the journals of uh, medical legal folks, they spent a lot of time thinking about how patients perceive risk at the time of informed consent. And what they found is that there's an enormous amount of intersubject variability. People hear very different things to the same words. And the words we use are often very, very imprecise. So let's come up with the word rare, for example. If we are talking to a patient about a procedure, a medication, or risk of pregnancy, and we say that the chance of an adverse outcome is rare, what they interpret varies by orders of magnitude. And those differences depend heavily on the overall health status, age, and demographics of the person you're talking to. On average, if you tell someone something is rare, the risk of a complication is rare, on average, they think it's about one in a thousand. If you tell that to a healthy 24-year-old, their assessment of what rare means is much less than one in a thousand. One in a thousand. However, if you tell it to a 75-year-old with cancer, they're estimate of a rare complication is much higher. So words like rare or imprecise, and we may have no idea what the patient interprets the word rare to mean. So even worse than using imprecise words is probably using relative risks. And this applies both to talking about your chance of dying is 100 times fold higher, with pregnancy with a mechanical heart valve as it is with someone with normal heart disease as it does to talking about lightning strikes. So here is a map of the probability of dying by a lightning strike anywhere in the United States. And you know, look, I'm thrilled to be living up here in the top left corner where my risk of dying by a lightning strike is just about zero. And my risk of dying by a lightning strike is more than a thousand times lower than were I to live in Florida. So I'm making a great choice. But I think it would be a little insane to say that folks should choose where they live based on the relative risk from dying from being hit by lightning because the relative risk is relatively irrelevant in this situation. So both patients and doctors, to be perfectly honest, can be misled by relative risks. We're much better off talking about absolute risks. Importantly, composite endpoints are really not another really important um, problem when we talk about risk. So when I talked about Carpreg and Zahara at the beginning, they talked about the risk of an adverse pregnancy outcome. And that included maternal death. And it also included maternal arrhythmia for which a woman might need to take a little bit of beta blocker. It's difficult to counsel a woman about the relative risks of each of those outcomes because those risks are so meaningfully different in terms of magnitude as it affects a woman's life. A woman very well may be willing to have an unplanned hospitalization or an arrhythmia, but unwilling to have a stroke or maternal death or need to go for emergent cardiac surgery during pregnancy. So these composite endpoints are dangerous too when they come to counseling women in terms of outcomes and not just women with pregnancy, but patients overall. Patients don't view risks as equivalent and we shouldn't make too many assumptions about which risks are most important to women. So some women may 
be willing to accept much higher risk. Some women may be willing to accept higher risk of adverse fetal outcomes to avoid risk to the mom. And some women may have a totally different set of priorities. So we should really make sure to ask about the patient's priorities. So what can we do to help patients understand risk better? Well, we should avoid using these vague descriptive terms like low risk, but you simultaneously need to be careful about avoiding a giant data dump where you give them every piece of data that overwhelms them and prevents them from being able to digest and make a sensible decision. When possible, you should use absolute numbers of risk and avoid talking in relative risks. And then finally, we should think a little bit about how we frame the risk. So we talked about the difference between positive framing, which encourages someone to make a risky choice, and loss framing, which discourages someone to make a risky choice. An example of positive framing is the chance that your heart valve would be fine during pregnancy is 93%. An example of risk framing would be, say, you have a 7% chance of having your valve fail during pregnancy and needing an emergency valve surgery. Not surprisingly, a helpful way to do it is to frame both. Say there's a 93% chance your valve would be fine and a 7% chance your valve would fail. It's a couple extra words, but it turns out that when you study this, it actually does impact how patients make decisions. You can consider visual aids like this here, six out of 100 people in a situation like yours will have an outcomes such as death or emergency surgery, et cetera. So these visual aids can help people, not just folks with low medical literacy, but folks in general really start to internalize what it means when we talk about the absolute risks of outcomes. So in summary, briefly, I think if I had to leave us with three take home points, I'd say the guidelines direct us towards the safest strategy but pregnancy in women with valvular heart disease can be risky and pregnancy with mechanical valves has no best option. There ain't no such thing as a free lunch and we need to be thoughtful about how we communicate risk and how we listen to the patient's priorities. So honestly, thank you. It's an honor to be invited down here uh, and be able to give grand rounds to you. It's a topic I care a lot about. So I, I thank you all for joining and for your, for your attention today. Thanks so much.